Today in Across the Fence, we look at two new exhibitions at the University of Vermont's Fleming Museum. We'll learn what place popular culture holds in fine art and how one artist's survival from Nazi Germany informs the surrealism of his paintings. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Keith Silva in for Judy Simpson. Since the first humans began painting on cave walls or stringing beads to make necklaces, somebody else has been nearby saying, yeah, okay, but what makes it art? As the saying goes, everyone's a critic. For 85 years, the Fleming Museum has been bringing art to the people, critics, and communities who call Vermont home. Spring brings a fresh perspective on things, and that's no different at the Fleming. This season, two exhibits, one on the art movement known as pop art, and another by a survivor of the Holocaust, continue to ask questions about art, and more to the point, what art says about humanity. Janie Cohen is the director of the Fleming Museum. Welcome back, Janie. Thank you, happy to be here. <laughs> Good, we're happy to have you. These two ex exhibitions seem at opposite ends of the spectrum. Is there any correlation between the two? Well, it's interesting. Um, you know, we didn't necessarily think about it when we planned them at the same time, but they really do show two extremes in terms of artistic expression. Mm -hmm. um, but both reacting directly to the experiences of the artists and the culture at the time. Um, but you know, you can compare them in many ways, but I think it's a great, a great kind of object lesson in terms of what art can do. And sort of going on at very similar times, Bach painting when all that pop art was, was yeah. emerging. Yeah, exactly. So in a way they were both reacting to, um, to the Second World War, mm. in a sense. Mm. In a moment we'll b visit both these exhibitions, but I want to ask you, when any piece of art is literally at our fingertips, uh, we can hold it in our hand, right. why go to a museum, to a gallery? I think, I mean, there are many reasons, but um, I would, I would urge people to, to try it, you know, to look at, look at the image on their handheld and, and then, um, you know, come to the museum and look. I mean, it's a matter of scale, it's a matter of, of seeing the artist's hand, even on a print, you know, on a pop art print, mm -hmm. you can, um, you know, you can really see how it was made and, and it, it has a different sense to it, it's right there in your face. That's right. Well, the movement known as pop art was all about making the mundane extraordinary, especially if you could find it in everyday life. Here's what Fleming curator Andrea Rosen told me about pop art and art. Is pop art art? Absolutely. It's right there in the title. A new exhibition of pop art prints is punching up the galleries at the University of Vermont's Fleming Museum. Pop art emerged in the 1960s, or really late 50s to early 1960s. Fine art before this was big abstract painting like Jackson Pollock. And for fine artists to be incorporating low art or popular culture into their fine art was really a huge gesture that, as we know, kind of reverberates to today because artists are still doing it. Andrea, there's some really well-known names in the show. Yeah, absolutely. It's Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein, Klaus Oldenburg. 37 Indiana. of the prints on display are from the Smithsonian American Art Museum's permanent collection. In addition, the Fleming has filled out the exhibition with prints from their own collection of female pop art artists. Women pop artists were um, very much still sort of discriminated against in a man's art world in the 60s, and um, their contribution is only kind of coming to be recognized again today. Pop women are maybe coming at the culture from a different perspective. Um, and so I think a really great example of that is the, the Marisol print, which is very sexual in nature. And we've juxtaposed it with some kind of um, erotic images by male artists. And the way male artists are using the female body is different than the way a woman artist is using the female body. Um, the male artists are kind of commenting on an increased sexuality in the culture and um, including in, in advertising. So you have the great image that illustrates this so clearly by Mel Ramos of a naked woman sitting on top of a box of cigarettes, right? And the way, so commenting on the way sexuality is used in advertising. And I think a lot of pop women artists are using the female body more in a way to reclaim their own sexuality. What's the impact of pop art today? I think pop art had a huge impact in terms of breaking down those barriers between popular culture and high art. And pop art happens at this moment that really distinguishes, if you'll forgive my using art historical terms, sort of modernism from postmodernism. And one of those, those hallmarks of postmodernism is kind of 
everything is fair game, right? So um, appropriating pre-existing imagery becomes fair game, and just in general, what fine art is opens up beyond just painting and sculpture um, to kind of anything. And from, from pop art, that kind of leads to things like performance art or installation art, things that really, um, as we were saying earlier, uh, plays with those um, boundaries of what art can be. It's more than just a painting or a sculpture. Um, it can be so much more and really kind of speak to the world around it. The Fleming Museum's exhibition of pop art prints engages with the past and the present and gives every visitor something to love. We're back in the studio now with Janie Cohen. Janie, as I was watching that and, and talking to Andrea, pop art seems everywhere. The images in the show, you can go almost anywhere and find a Marilyn Monroe or, or any of that sort of thing. Does pop art still have any edginess nowadays? Well, it's interesting, and this gets back to the question of why I see it in a gallery, because I feel like when you're standing in front of it, for instance, that Marilyn Monroe image, mm -hmm. it has this incredible power. And it still feels to me, it still feels fresh, mm -hmm. even though you know they're reproduced over and over and over again um, but you know again when you're standing in front of the actual object um, I think it does excellent well another exhibition at the Fleming is a retrospective that from a prolific artist as well as an explanation of the human experience Rebecca Gollin tells us more Samuel Bach's first art show took place when he was nine years old and living with his family in a ghetto in Poland 75 years later his most recent show is on display at the University of Vermont's Fleming Museum. We wanted to collaborate with the Holocaust Study Center here at UVM and asked if there were particular artists they'd be interested in showing here, and Samuel Bach was the name that came up right away. Born in Vilna, Poland in 1933, Bach and his family were confined to a ghetto and later sent to a labor camp. Only he and his mother survived spending the next several years in displaced persons camps. Bach was painting all the while. You'll see a few um, sort of shifts over time in the show, which is roughly, although not exactly chronological, but you'll see from his early watercolors and paintings, very kind of expressionistic, almost abstract in places. And then he evolves into the style he uses mostly throughout his career, which is what he depicts is surrealistic, um, but the manner in which he's depicting it is very realistic. It's very finely painted, very detailed, almost in the style of a Renaissance painting. The show is entitled Survival and Memory, and the work encompasses a broad time frame, including paintings from those very early years to the present. The paintings explore and communicate Bach's experience as a Holocaust survivor, while expressing universal truths about human frailty. What you'll see in the exhibition is not very explicit images of what happened in the Holocaust. It's really the artist processing not just the Holocaust, but the questions that such an event raises about humanity in general, human nature, the nature of history, the nature of how we treat each other. Certain images appear over and over, particularly Jewish letters and iconography. Other frequent themes include decaying landscapes and rotting fruit, especially pears, which represent humans in many of his paintings. Bach also appropriates familiar images into his work, including well-known paintings and photographs. This is a great example of how um, layered and complex some of Samuel Bach's paintings can be. This is from a series called Landscapes of the Jewish Experience. And um, he's using um, Jewish symbols in, in a particular way. In this one, you see um, the shapes of the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. And you also see it is broken up into four different chambers. And this refers to a Jewish theological concept um, called Pardes of um, the, the different levels of understanding of scripture. It reads from right to left the way you would read Hebrew and goes from so the simplest, most straightforward uh, understanding, reading of a text to the most complex and esoteric. And you see that the chambers get increasingly um, more difficult to access. Bach's recent work incorporates a more colorful palette, giving a touch of lightness to the serious themes of humanity he's still exploring in his 80s. Certainly some of that is, is a little heavy, um, but then other parts of it aren't, and you'll see that with one of the uh, most recent paintings in the show where he's taken to using the letters of the word hope 
in the landscape. And so there is always that flip side of, of the darkness is the light. Bringing hope to the landscape while exploring the darker sides of humanity. Samuel Bach is an artist with a lot more to say. At the Fleming Museum, I'm Rebecca Gullen with Across the Fence. Well, thanks, Rebecca. If you're just joining us, we're talking about the new art and new uh, exhibitions at UVM Fleming Museum with Jeannie Cohen. Jeannie, I know you work with all of the university to put together a lot of these shows. How did you work with UVM's Holocaust Studies program? So the Center for Holocaust Studies, our colleagues there actually brought Samuel back to our attention. Um, so neither um, Andrea nor I had been familiar with him, and uh, we were really thrilled to learn about him um, and to be able to show the work. And is Samuel Bach, this, is this the first time his work has been shown in Vermont? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Wonderful. Um, one of the things, it, it, watching with this, and Andrea mentioned at the end, these are very hopeful paintings. So when someone hears Holocaust, I know there's a tendency to maybe draw back, but there's a lot to be sort of learned from this show. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're very human, humane and human, and um, there is there is a lot of hope in them. And actually, the, um, the bright colors in the more recent work, we asked um, the gallery who we were working with in Boston about the change in his palette, and, and the response was, he's very happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wonderful. What do you hope that people take away from both uh, the pop art show and the Samuel Bach show when they leave? What, what, what's yeah. the goal there? I think it's, um, you know, getting back to um, our conversation at the beginning, I, I think it, it really shows the role that art can play in, you know, in society and just for each of us. Um, you know, it is a reflection of our environment, of, you know, the social environment. Um, you know, and the personal environment. Um, and it can open up doors to different experiences for us. What are you seeing with people coming through the gallery? Are you seeing younger people, students, older folks? Actually, it's, um, these two shows are attracting a really broad age range, both mm -hmm. of them, which is pretty exciting. And I think, you know, everybody is familiar with pop art and, and certainly the Holocaust is, you know, is something that, that we all learn about. Um, and so it's really, both of them are attracting a lot of people of different ages. And you've got, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Samuel Bach is going to be coming uh, to UVM? Um, yeah, he is not speaking, but he is coming up to see the exhibition. And he, he couldn't come for the opening because he had too many openings <laughs> and, and um, things going on this, this spring. So I think it was really interesting about Bach. I had not known about them, and I, yeah. I won't out you, but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. but he's an artist that's been so prolific that more people should find out about his, about his work. Absolutely. That's our feeling as well, and if we can play some small role in that, that'll be terrific. And really something that, you know, uh, a reason that someone should visit a regional uh, museum or any museum for yeah. is to sort of learn about learn about something, good to learn at yeah, UVM, but yeah, also yeah. good to learn about someone you had never known, or heard about exactly. before. Exactly, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, one of the things I have to say about uh, uh, about visiting the Fleming is these two exhibitions are great. You've got a great uh, show that was a student created show yes. called Sex, Sex Objects that's going on. And you know, walk up those marble stairs when you're there because the rest of the galleries yeah. are, are are so much fun at the Fleming. Oh, terrific! Thank you. <laughs> um, Janie, as, as we wrap up, I want to thank you. How can people find out more about the Fleming Museum? Um, two ways. You can go online to FlemingMuseum.org um, or call our general information number, which is 656-2090. Excellent. Excellent. Well, once again, thank you, Janie. Um, I want to thank everyone here at WCAX for making this program possible. And as always, thank you for stopping by Across the Fence.